With a Latin name of Jacus patasonus, this species of snake is a very interesting specimen indeed. Easily identified by his low stature and peculiar bald head, Jacus is most likely to be found hibernating in the southwest corner of Australia. But during his active months, the snake is a vicious predator. Using his keen senses and incredible stealth, any prey is easy picking. He is nothing less than a savage beast. His mother, on the other hand, <laughs> describes him like this. Jake was not a snake. He was a little brat. He was a slippery little character when he was smaller, though. He was always hiding in places. He loved hiding from other kids, tucking himself away so no one can see him. Drove me mental. <laughs> That's what he did. He loved tearing things up. He'd rip this and he'd rip that. Always ripping and tearing into everything he can get his hands on. Oh, yeah, he had a dream of flying, you know. Uh, I think he thought he was Superman and we got terribly worried about him. Quite scared of the water he was too. Not. You don't catch a wave, a wave catches you. The sooner you work that out, the better off you'll be. Talk to me. Talk to me. <laughs> Just keep 
Keeping your time with your foot in the door Of every restaurant you eat for free cause you're the law The man, the fuzz, the deep piggy and the guff If you're bringing home the bacon then you're someone that he loves But well, oh my god, hey, just jump back I'll make a little way for the blue from the blue hat Oh my god, hey, we'll just jump back I'll make a little room for the blue from the blue hat But well, oh my god, hey, we'll just jump back I'll make a little way for the blue from the blue hat Oh my god, hey, we'll just jump back I'm making a little room for the flip from the blue hat. Fat cop, hey! Fat cop! Fat cop, hey! Fat cop! Yeah, 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 yeah! Fat cop, hey! Fat cop! Fat cop, hey! Fat cop! Yeah, 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 yeah! Hi, I'm going to take you up close and personal with one of the most radical surfers in the world today, Jake the Snake Patterson. Jake's story is one definitely worth telling. It's the ups, the downs, the wins and losses. Jake Patterson is proof that even the seemingly impossible can be achieved. Jake is totally focused, unbelievably motivated amazingly fit and has this incredible skill level that puts him in the top percentage of sportsmen in the world. But all that's come together over a very long period of time. So let's wind the clock back and find out from the snake himself what things were like taking that all-important first step into the international surfing arena. I was so confused when I was at school. Didn't know really what I wanted to do. I came through um, Western Australia probably is the the best surfer in my age, so um, I was pretty confident that I could maybe be a professional surfer, but I didn't know what track or where to go or anything like that, so um, I spent all day thinking about it, um, and then i go surfing. <laughs> Before school, during school and after school, so all we thought it was bloody surfing. There's this guy called Jock Campbell that managed um, guys like me, Matt Branson, Josh Palmatier, basically for nothing, just to help out the West Australian professional surfers because we're a little bit behind the Eastern State guys. We didn't have as much push and everything like that. We caught up with Jake's dad, Mark. We talked about the first time his son's surfing captured the attention of West Australian surfing promoter, Jock Campbell. And Jock would say, hey, Pato, you've got a, you know, a little bit of potential there. I said, it looks all right to me, you know, it's just natural, you know. <laughs> Because it happens all the time, and they say, wow, look at that. And I said, well, yeah, it's all right. So they came around here, and we sat downstairs for probably five or six minutes. And you could just see by looking at the guy that he was on it. You know, he really wanted to be a pro surfer. Mum and Dad were unreal, really supported me heaps through the whole thing. You know, I, I had no money, and, and they basically helped me out. I was spending so much money, and, you know, Dad basically lent me the money to go do it. Jake's first trip to Europe proved to be a bit of a nightmare. It was the first time he'd been away anywhere by himself, and he had to deal with pretty well everything on his own. And as you would expect of someone of that age let loose in Europe, Jake was all over the show. It's not easy probably living out of a surfboard bag and things the first time away, but uh, I think they had a great time. That first venture onto the circuit proved to be close to a complete failure. Jake was totally disorientated with the direction the surfing business was taking him. He did get through a couple of heats in the early rounds of some events, but when he came up against the seated guys, they smoked him. I really thought I'd failed, basically. Um, I really thought I couldn't be a professional surfer. It was too hard. In hindsight, I look back and really thought I should have been studying success back then. Um, looking at the guys who were winning, winning events, winning heats, winning anything, because I wasn't winning anything, so, um, you know, it's really important. In those days, playing it safe was not going to get Jake anywhere, and he knew it. The conservative approach was out, and aggression was in. And this brave change of attitude proved to be a critical turning point in Jake's career. All winners take chances. They push themselves to new limits. They seek out, and they conquer the extreme. If they manage to pull it off, they move up. If you're smart, you'll look at who's winning competitively. 
You'll study what they're up to, and then you'll put what you've learned into practice. I mean, how can you win if you don't know how to do it? So it's a part of what I learned through the ACC when I was doing all the junior contests is studying the guys that were winning because I thought I was on the same level as those guys. Not the professional guys, but the, the junior guys. I was on the same level, so I, I came back and started the success from the guys that are winning those contests and, and it all turned around. I won three or four junior events and, and won the circuit there, so it was a big turning point. It all turned around when I came home and, and did the Margaret River event when I did really well. I finished ninth in, in that event and I beat Dave McCullough, the defending champion for the event. It really turned my whole career around. The training part of things came along more with a friend of mine called John Malloy. He really gave me a kick up the bum for you know, thinking that I could just do this on my own back and just thought I had the natural talent and everything to just be like everyone else. Steve Smith took him under his wing. Um, Smith, he's a good trainer. I'd heard of Jake and I knew that he was quite a character and I was asked to, would I be interested in doing some fitness work, motivation, a little bit of head stuff. I said it'd be an absolute pleasure. You know, he gave me the you know, gave me the spiel, you know, if you want to be number one, you've got to at least be professional about it and put your head down and put your bum up and do some hard work. Anyway, Jake was late. I couldn't believe it. S Steve Smith's an ex-Navy diver, which is, that's why I call him the drill sergeant. The discipline that he's shown me has been incredible, like to take everything one, you know, you're going to do something, you may as well do it 100% or not do it at all. You can't rock up to a contest and be late and late for heats, you know, he made me realise if you're going to do something, you've got to do it properly, so. It changed my whole way of thinking about contests. You know, the fitter I am, the more I, the more time I spend out in the back and you know paddling back out, I can do lots more things I want to do in heats instead of having to do what my body can do. Like I can push my body to to more limits, even if it's one percent extra I can get out of a heat. It's one percent more than the other guys. <laughs> Jake's training regime makes the French Foreign Legion look like a bunch of Nancy boys. The guy actually runs along the bottom of the ocean with a 50 kilo rock in his arms. It's not very normal, folks, but it all sort of ties in. If he gets dragged down to the bottom by some monster wave, he's got to be able to deal with that, or else he'll die. So the more time he spends training underwater, the more relaxed he becomes when he does get help. It's the whole key to big wave surfing and to some other things in life. Just got to relax. When it's big. I'm burning black from the Dago. I'm burning black from the Dago. I'm burning black from the Dago. When I used to coach all these kids, I used to always believe that you had to be physically fit and you had to be fitter than the other bloke that you're competing against. And I didn't coach Jake into that, he just knew all that and he still knows that now. Towards the end of my training program, I'm always nearly exhausted, ready to collapse. But then I think about the end of a heat when I need to catch another wave, you know, I just comes down to the fear of losing. I mean, I way hate of losing is overpowers everything in my whole life, basically. And we find a little challenge, like instead of six times up a sand hill, we'll do seven times. So I'll run those extra two dunes and think about the last time I lost. 
Instead of uh, eight times up yelling uphill on a push bike, we'll do nine times. And it, and it really makes me, you know, I, I work on emotions, I train on emotions. Just keep on lifting that bar higher. Oh, he's extremely motivated. He's one of the best competitors there is. He's, he's so psyched, he won't give you an inch in the water at all. Eliminate everything I can control and rely on solely the waves. So I can control my fitness, my personal life, my equipment, and my mental ability. His fitness is um, probably one of his greatest assets along with his tenacity. Determination is what I think about when you mention Snake. In our search for the story behind Jake, we spoke to a lot of people from his past including his old high school teacher, Rod Downing. As a role model, Jake's sensational because he wasn't, a, uh, he wasn't an Einstein at school. Um, and I think he's proven to many students that you don't have to be a, a gun at school to be able to follow your dreams and to achieve them. Young people give pro surfers a sort of icon status. And it's always been totally important to Jake that his profile out of the water is one that has a positive influence on young people he meets. We were unfortunate to have a suicide in my son's surfboard riding club at South City Beach. And one of the people in charge or involved with the club thought it would be a good idea to invite a guest speaker to come along and speak to the, the board riders uh, of the club about the problems with drug taking and alcohol. And Jake came along and spoke and uh, was was fantastic. Taj Burrow is a name that strikes fear into the hearts of even the most experienced world-class surfer. He represents a new wave of flashy, big air showstoppers. And while Taj has slashed his way into the limelight over the past five or so years, like Jake, he started young, got smart early, and is now reaping the rewards of the fast times of life on the pro surfing circuit. I moved down to Yelling Up when I finished school and he basically changed my surfing from the first day I started surfing with him. He's one of the most explosive surfers in the world today, so you know, surfing with someone every day with such a high, at such a high level like that is, is incredible for my surfing. He's brought me to a level that I never ever thought I could be at. When I was living in Yelling Up, when I actually when he moved to Yelling Up, because I lived in Yelling Up first, he's just a blowing from Perth. But uh, I was living in Yelling Up and I remember seeing the Patterson brothers kicking around, lighting up the surf every day. Surfing has changed so much. Today, it seems to be all about spending as much time in the air as physically possible. Hitting puns and getting doing some crazy puns, crazy grabs, and getting crazy shots. Uh, he's a maniac. They were asking me the other week if he puns, and I said yes, and they all blew up at me. But it's snake puns, mate. <laughs> Jake was growing up, Ant-Man was just so gutsy for his size and age. In the 90s, Ant-Man took four years out of his surfing career and did his chef apprenticeship. I think that's where I sort of, he left me behind and went on with the job. And I sort of kicked back down south and just enjoyed the southwest lifestyle. But you can't keep a good man down, and now he's back on the big wave circuit. Ant-Man's just got this style, this cruisy style, and he just looks so cool surfing sunset. It could well be the hardest wave in the world to surf, and he's the smallest guy, yet he probably surfs at the best.
1995 was a turning point for me. I spent all the off-season training really hard with Smithy. I came out of the gates all guns blazing for the WQS Australian League. I made the semi-finals in Newcastle, the semi-finals in Margaret River, made the final in New Zealand, and I won the Billabong Pro on the Gold Coast. I knew if I had kept my head together for that year, I had a really good chance of qualifying. 1996 was my first year in the WCT Tour. It was a long and gruelling year for me. I was so amped and motivated that I competed in about 32 contests, 12 WCTs and about 20 WQS events. I won the WQS that year and the highlight of my WCT year was making the final in Reunion Island. Nineteen ninety six was also the year of the Gracetown tragedy. It shocked West Australians to the core. I was in Portugal for a WQS event, got a phone call from a friend saying there'd been a terrible accident down in Gracetown. A lot of people we knew had died, including Lindsay Thompson, who'd been away with us coaching us a couple of times in the scholastic contest and stuff, so it was really, really heavy. It was a heavy time for me. I really dug down deep for that contest and really tried to focus on Lindsay basically. Really tried to take all the words he'd given me in the past and really focused on, on the goal at hand and I ended up coming through and winning that event. It was really a touching moment. I dedicated that win to those guys. Margaret's has always been a really tricky one for me. I always expect way more out of myself from that event. Had I gone through my career without winning that event, I don't know what I would have done. This is what I won Margaret's on. Well, as you can see, it was a 6'5". <laughs> um, conditions that day was about 4 or 5 foot. Uh, mainly going right that day. It was kind of like onshore, but really fast snaps on the right. Masters aside, Pipeline's the event. You've got waves here that have traveled 10,000 kilometers for the specific purpose of putting you in the hospital. The waves were huge for the first couple of rounds of pipe that year. The amphitheater of Pipeline is incredible. You're surfing only 50 meters from the beach, and these monster waves are just breaking in a couple of feet of water. Everyone on shore sees exactly what happens. You've got to walk through the crowd to get to the water, and the same when you come back in. The whole atmosphere is just gnarly. When that wave's coming, you've got to be committed 110%. Picks you up, and away you go. Like Jake says, you don't catch a wave, a wave catches you. The surf at the pipe is so aggressive, and if you're not equally aggressive back, you're gonna get yourself cream. Jake took some pretty heavy wipeouts that year. It's a miracle he didn't get himself seriously injured. My grandfather passed away a couple of days before the event started, so I was kind of surfing for him in a way. He was looking after me out there for sure. Like, I took some really bad wipeouts and I didn't get hurt. And for that wave to come through in the last couple of seconds for, for me to win the final, I reckon it was pretty special. I reckon he was looking after me. Well, the Pipeline Masters was the most exciting Pipeline Masters in the history of the event. Uh, all the focus was on Kelly Slater, Mick Campbell and Danny Wills for the world title race. And no one realised Jake was there just, you know, knocking people off on the way. Yeah, she's not the one. 
Bruce had the better start out of both of us. I had to come from behind, but the lead ended up changing about six or seven times. He went to the lead with about a minute to go. He was coming in, I think he thought he'd won. And then I was looking out the horizon and it looked dead flat. And one of the guys yelled out with about 20 seconds to go, out the back. So I look up and there's this little lump. I look and I thought, oh, I'm too far out. So I put my head down and start heading for the shore. And then I get into it with about three seconds to go. I look up, I go, oh no, it's a closeout. Try and do these huge big pumps in the pit. And then the wave went all foamy and there's a tiny little gap in the lip that just let me squeak out. And then the emotions took over, the arms went in the air. Snake reckons he wasn't even going to get barreled in the pipe punish. He said he'd be happy if he went out in his first heat and just get a barrel. Because it's so hard to get a wave out there free surfing that he was just like, oh, I'll be happy if I just get a pit in my heat. And the freak goes out and nails it. Yeah. It's, it's what we Brazilians usually say about Jake, that he likes, he loves to take the sweet out of the baby's mouth. A pipe, it couldn't be a better way, you know? And uh, would have never been better a guy but the snake, you know? For Ozzy, you know, because he's the snake, he's the one that comes back. <laughs> Oh my god! Best ever. Doesn't get any better than that. Perfect <laughs> This is an old JC74, ex Shane Dorian, ex my brothers. I stole it off my brother to ride it in the Pipe Masters, and I'm winning me the contest. These guys put on a show, jockeying for position from first to second, back and forth. It came down to the last 90 seconds, yeah, and then yeah. it came down to the last eight seconds with a 9.6 ride through the back door for Jake Patterson. I was nominated for Sports Star of the Year after Pipe. It was a pretty big night, black tie and all. We rocked up and there was a stress ball in everyone's seat. Didn't know really what it was for until I realised that I made the final, I had to get up for a speech. Lucky for that stress ball, I tell you. You're not getting it back. <laughs> now, uh, confidence is a remarkable thing in sport. And you think back to the Coca-Cola Masters, was that a turning point for you? Oh, for sure. I've been wanting to win that event for years. And, um, like, I went on to, to go to Bells after the Margaret's and got a good placing there, and then it carried me on through the years. I've never gone backwards in my ratings in the WCT, so that's why 1999 was a pressure cooker of a year. I finished ninth in 98, so I really wanted to go a step ahead of that. Came down to the end of the year, I was coming 12th before Pipeline. My first round heat shouldn't have been a problem. Defending champion, and I blew it. I went out there and was freaking out about losing and my ratings and defending champion and everything like that, instead of just going out there, enjoying it, getting a few barrels, and it wouldn't have been a problem. Sometimes your successes can build on your failures. And once again, Jake managed to turn things around because he didn't let it get him down. When he didn't make the top 10, he couldn't let it get to him. Instead, he put a more exhaustive effort into his off-season for the 2000 tour. Two thousand was a great year for me. I made three WCT finals, I made the final at the Gold Coast, I made the final at Trestles, and I won the Billabong Pro at Jeffreys Bay. It was a good year. It's Jake. This is me.
This is a little 6.0, oh, hot dog board, good for boosting. Right at the trestle, has got second in that. Jeffrey's Bay is a super tricky wave to surf in a contest. It's normally super inconsistent and you really don't have many chances if you blow a wave. So it really suits my style, kind of open face, forehand hacks. I really enjoy it. Oh, everything just fell into place, I'm stoked. <laughs> this is my uh, 2000 J-Bay board, channel bottom. Really fast, really good in the pit. Conditions were about three, four foot that day. Pretty nice. I was bummed out how I started the contest this year in J-Bay. I had a pretty solid heat to start off with, but I'm getting pipped at the post in the last couple of minutes and got thrown into the 33rd round, which I didn't want to be for that contest especially. But I ended up fighting my way back through to the final, and I had the final against Taylor Knox, so I was super stoked to have the chance to go back to back. Especially, he just took chances in heats and um, let it come down to like the last, you know, few seconds. And most of his heats actually came down to that, and then he'd get the get the last wave. Patterson from Australia, this year's winner! 255,000 Rand, 50,000 US dollars from Western Australia, Jake Patterson, let's hear it for the man! I wouldn't be surprised if he goes three in a row, but uh, we'll all be out to stop him. This is the latest addition to the, to the quiver, 6-3, J-Bay winner 2001. Sick, this board went sick in all conditions from when it was two foot to about six, eight foot. I'm spending all my time diving around, picking with the There are two types of people in this world. Those who talk about what they're gonna do and those who actually get out there and do it. And Snake is a classic example of the latter. Jake is a surfer with an approach that can only be described as fanatically intense. There are many people in the surfing fraternity who honestly believe that both Jake's level of skill and his natural abilities are still coming of age. Jake's ferocious temperament and never say die attitude are the reasons why he's won back-to-back -back Billabong pros at J-Bay. And his explosive final seconds in the 1998 Pipeline Masters final gave him a surfing status that can only be described as legendary. Yeah, we 
He's got a big nose, bad haircut. Is there anyone more professional than that kid? There you go. I don't think there is. He lives in a good place and hopefully he'll give me a free video. 